Right, yeah. Well, thank you for this opportunity, Matt. It's um, kind of cool to be sitting down, giving a keynote <laughs> with my dog outside the door. <laughs> so uh, apologies if there's um, serious barking that occurs during this. Um, and hello to everyone out there in cyber world. Um, you'll notice uh, there were some poll questions. So the idea is um, to make it a little bit more interactive today. Uh, so you can answer the questions as we go along. Um, I have four problems that I talk about today. So um, four of the questions relate to those four problems. Um, or if you want, if I keep you so enthralled, you can just complete the poll at the end. How's that sound? Sounds awesome. Cool, cool let's go. All right, I wanna start with the first question. Have you ever thought a lot about how we deal with things in safety is in the negative? that if you don't abide by a policy, you will be reprimanded. If you deviate from a procedure, you will be injured. If you don't fulfill your duty of care, you will be prosecuted. If someone is seriously injured, you will be penalized. You will be denounced. And if someone dies, you will go to jail. Our systems lay out rules and responsibilities and controls and, and how we monitor them. It's almost like you have no choice. It's either this way or it's the highway. And if you choose the highway, then I'm sorry to say, mate, but you might be on the highway to hell. And it's there, you will be punished. So what's crazy is that we consider this acceptable, that it's an inherent belief that people are, should be sufficiently punished and that that will deter everyone else from veering down that designated path. So today I want to talk a little bit more broadly about how we can transform enforcement, about stopping and considering breaking the norm when it comes to addressing non-compliant actions and behaviour, thinking about how we can advance from relying on punishment and deterrence and being more collaborative and restorative. So I'm going to talk about four problems that I see with the punitive approach. And I want to discuss this idea how we can better influence behaviour and decision making. Because really that's what we do, isn't it? We influence, we negotiate, we persuade. So I want you to think about how we can influence better than just through the punitive means. How we can create greater awareness, we can shape desires, build knowledge, insight action, and reinforce it with not quite such a big safety stick. Cool. Well, I'll give my introduction <laughs> for Matt instead. Uh, so for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Naomi Kemp, not spelt the uh, New Zealand way that Matt has there on the screen. <laughs> um, I'm the founder of Safe Expectations, which is a health and safety strategy business. So naturally, I specialise in, in developing, facilitating and managing enforceable undertakings. Um, but this keynote is about sharing with you my learnings on restorative practice over my career so far. From working with numerous of companies to successfully have an enforceable undertaking accepted, helping businesses put health and safety strategies in place to create just culture, and more recently spending time in Vancouver with WorkSafe BC, where we were workshopping how to enforce safety differently from a regulatory approach. So you will guess by the end of this, or you will know that I'm really passionate about enforceable undertakings because I've researched them and I've been involved in, in so many that have been truly impactful. And I love the opportunity to talk about them because you know, when you go to a barbecue and you say you work in health and safety and you get that whole oh, OHS eye roll, we'll try saying that you work in enforceable undertakings and see what response you get. So today I'm going to discuss enforcement from uh, two, pers two perspectives. External enforcement, so that is the regulatory enforcement tools and how they use them in a responsive regulatory and risk-based prioritization approach. That's a big word. <laughs> and internal enforcement. So that is how companies enforce health and safety through their policies, procedures and practices. For many years, believe it or not, I'm only five foot five, I was a uh, basketball player and a high level basketball coach. And when you coach elite athletes, not winning a game is failure. And failure 
is punishment. So as their coach, you don't then go and beat them with a big stick at the next training session. You reflect on the performance and the positives and the negatives, and you get agreement with the team on the way to move forward. You then train your ass off so that the next time you're on the court, success happens as though it's inherent because you are built to win and not because you are relying on some rigid structure or process full of rules to follow to achieve success. That's kind of my philosophy. So let's start with the current state of our safety laws and our regulatory reliance on retributive justice as the best form of enforcement to create deterrence to achieve compliance. Now, I think there are four problems with a punitive approach. So when I say a punitive approach, I'm talking about the proportionate punishment of offenders, which is known as retributive justice. Now, culturally, we have learned something, when something goes wrong, we should blame and punish people. And we actually get this from the English, you know, so we'll blame them. <laughs> Since the introduction of the Factory Act and the establishment of a professional factory inspectorate back in 1933, under the then Prime Minister, Earl Grey. This was then followed by and supported by uh, Sir Robert Peel, the father, the father of modern British policing. And it was under these guys that justice was all about retribution. Back then, if you were offended, it was against the state or the king. And today it's still the same. It's against the crown. And what's crazy about that is that the Crown doesn't get upset because a person has been hurt necessarily, but because one of their assets has been damaged. And so thanks to the English, this punitive culture has spread throughout the Commonwealth. And what we see today in our health and safety laws because of this traditional form of justice is that punishment and penalties are still considered the best response to a violation by a regulator but also within our internal company policies and procedures. So, as I said, I, I think there are four problems. Number one, inconsistent enforcement and penalties. For those of you who are a bit like me and you keep your eye on enforcement outcomes and prosecutions, so health and safety prosecutions, particularly, um, and the penalties, you'll probably at some point have questioned their consistency. This has been a bit of a frustration of mine for some time. To me, discipline needs to be disciplined. It needs to be consistent. Otherwise, you just won't get the effect you're after. I, I don't know if everyone out there has children, but I certainly do. And I just think if I try and discipline one child more harshly than the other for the same thing, you'll uh, very much get a, the, the responses in this photo here. <laughs> Under our health and safety laws, the harshest punishment is prosecution, which potentially leads to a court penalty more often, uh, but can also lead to imprisonment. This is generally reserved for the most serious offences and the most recalcitrant and dangerous offenders. Yet in Australia, between uh, the years 2016 and 17, the average prosecution penalty was $60,000. So if I put it a different way, $60,000 is 2% of the maximum penalty for a corporation, and it's not quite 10% for an individual. In comparison, in Queensland, if you breach the Food Act, that's right, the Food Act, where no one can be seriously harmed, uh, it could result in a $30,000 fine. So it was no surprise to see the submissions and outcomes in our Australian Senate inquiry into industrial deaths, deaths sorry, reflecting the frustration and inconsistent enforcement and penalties. In that final report, the Senate committee for that inquiry stated, I think I've got it on the slide here, 
stated that the committee observes that the low level of penalties handed down in the recent past do not meet community expectations about the gravity of workplace fatalities and nor do they effectively deter other organisations from disregarding the safety of workers. Not long after the Senate report, Marie Boland also reported in her review of the model health and safety laws, the inconsistencies of enforcement across our jurisdictions, reducing the effect of punitive punishment and deterrence. And Boland's report also went a bit deeper than prosecution. She commented on inconsistencies with other punitive regulatory tools, such as infringement notices and prohibition notices uh, across our Australian jurisdictions. And she also compared them to the other legislation. So to give you an indication of the inconsistencies here, in New South Wales, the maximum penalty notice, which is like an on-the-spot fine, is $3,600. But generally they start at $125, which in Australia is half the cost of a speeding ticket. Okay, second problem, the reliance on the deterrence effect. Earlier this year, an Australian farmer was found guilty and fined $475,000 because a 14 year old boy was killed when he fell off a tractor trailer. Will and his twin brother, Tom, were working on the farm in the school holidays. On that particular day, the boys had been collecting irrigation pipe in the paddocks and they were loading them onto the back of the trailer. It was hitched to the tractor, kind of like in this picture here. At the end of the line, Will stood on the small platform between the tractor and the trailer to make the long journey back to the farmhouse. He stood there because the tractor only had one seat for the driver, which was his inexperienced and unlicensed brother Tom. Now, it probably seemed logical to stand there as there was no other way of getting back to the farmhouse besides walking. And to be honest, who would want to do that after a long, hard day in the paddock? So why did the farmer think that the boys would do anything different? Why didn't he tell them not to ride on the trailer platform? In Australia, and I'm certainly sure in New Zealand, there has been so much education and awareness and campaigns that have been done around farm and vehicle safety. And I'm certain other farmers have been prosecuted for similar fatalities around tractors and mobile equipment. Yet that didn't make this farmer stop and think. In this case, the magistrate in Queensland set our third largest monetary penalty at the time. The magistrate stated, general deterrence and denunciation are of significant importance in this case. Significant importance. However, in sentencing, not only did the magistrate give the offenders a 50% discount on the penalty for their early guilty plea, he also agreed not to record the conviction against both the director and the company or the PCBU. So not only do we have problems with inconsistent penalties, but there's also a discount on them. Seriously, you get a discount when you buy a television, not when you plead guilty to a workplace fatality. I think perhaps here we should um, use some different language on that one because getting a discount does not help if you are trying to deter people. So the idea of general deterrence um, works on the notion of deterring general public, um, industries, communities, from committing a crime by punishing those who offend. So when an offender is punished, it sends a clear message to the rest of society that the behavior of this sort will result in an unpleasant response from the justice system. To achieve this though, to deter general public, they then need to know about it. And in this case, there's actually very little knowledge about what happened. Apart from those involved in the prosecution process, only the local community knows what happened and who was involved. 
The local media initially reported the tragic incident, but there was no media coverage of the prosecution. Queensland's third highest monetary penalty did not warrant a newspaper article. So unless you're going go and search through Queensland's reg, uh, regulator's public prosecution register, you won't find much on this case. So if no one really knows about it, how do you get general deterrence from it? Which leads me to the third problem, lackluster denunciation. Probably not quite the case for Mark Zuckerberg, uh, but what I'm, my point here is that in addition to no media coverage of the prosecution on that farmer's case, the names of the offenders have not been published anywhere. Now, I'm not advocating shaming. I just wonder if denunciation is of significant importance, then unless it's a high profile or a newsworthy case, how are we actually achieving that? Now, there's actually a, a reason behind why we don't see acts of public denunciation. And it comes down to, in Queensland particularly, um, our regulators publishing policies, uh, which, which naturally stem from our Queensland legislation. And that relates to the recording of a conviction. So in Queensland, where a court orders no conviction to be recorded, they'll remove all identifiable information from any publications. So as I said earlier, the offender had no conviction recorded and as such, there's no identifying information published. So even though denunciation was significantly important, they're not allowed to denounce them. No conviction equals silence and silence to me does not denounce or deter people. Now, apart from being a director myself, um, I do a lot of work with boards and executives around risk appetite and tolerance. And what is really interesting about those conversations is that safety is always in their top five risks because they don't want to hurt anybody. But what outranks safety almost every time is reputation. Even those companies who say safety is their number one priority. And when it comes to financial impact, they know they can afford a safety breach, but it's the cost of reputational damage that is uncertain and what really concerns them. So last problem I, I think is the efficacy of punitive consequences. So what I see with this problem is the current approach of enforcement is the efficacy of punitive consequences. In particular, regulatory researchers have been um, warning us of this reduced uh, confidence level um, of prosecution for some time. Uh, so Richard Johnson uh, reports in the way in which health and safety offences are treated in the court system and the focus on individual and specific events rather than the broader context such as organisational work and the quality of health and safety management may be reducing the broader impact of prosecution. And I've heard time and time again, and I'm sure some of you have as well, that prosecution is considered in some cases a bit like the old slap on the wrist. And then you just return to work, business as usual. Now I'm sharing this, unfortunately this is an unpublished study that we conducted here in Queensland into the effectiveness of enforceable undertakings in comparison to prosecutions as an enforcement option. Uh, one of the interviewees made this comment, and I've highlighted the main part. A simple fine, you just walk up to the accountant, you tell them to pay the fine, and it just goes. Nothing happens. We had lots of comments similar to that in this study. So then of course, there's always the issue that you can buy statutory liability insurance, which covers fines, penalties, rep, rep, uh, legal costs of investigating and defending your claims. So is it that the big stick just doesn't really hurt as much as what we think? The question this raises in my mind is, reduced efficacy of punitive consequences once 
one of the is this one of the reasons why we have a very little shift in our fatality and injury statistics over the past several years for example if we look just at prosecution under our national compliance and enforcement policy here in australia prosecution is described as the response used as i said earlier for the most serious offenses the most recalcitrant and dangerous offenders so if we look at the prosecution statistics the total number of prosecutions in Australia uh, in 2016 and 17 was 221. We had in that same time frame 178 fatalities. And if we look at the serious injury rate, it was 9.3 per 1,000 employees. That then totals to 106,438 fatalities and serious injuries. Now, I understand this is not a perfect comparison. I'm no statistician. And there are many factors involved in both prosecution and injury claims. But even if I add in other punitive enforcement actions, which were 43,940 notices. So they were the prohibition, improvement and infringement notices handed out across Australia in that same time frame. We're still only at 44,161 regulatory actions, which still significantly is below the number of fatalities and serious injuries for that year. What I think this demonstrates is a lack of enforcement action, which reinforces the lack of deterrence being generated from these punitive consequences. Remembering that deterrence works when people believe there's a good chance that non-compliance will be detected and they will be sufficiently punished. So when you're not being consistent and actively using the powers of the regulator to reduce the efficacy, Oh, sorry, you do then reduce the efficacy of punitive consequences and you just don't change behaviour. So I see these four problems uh, with the punitive approach. And so now I want to discuss um, some ideas um, on how we can better influence behaviour and decision making. What, what is it that we can do to advance from this reliance on punishment and deterrence and become more collaborative and restorative in meeting compliance obligations and potentially beyond that. Rightio. So this is the um, pyramid that comes out of the national compliance and enforcement policy that I mentioned earlier. The pyramid uh, represents the responsive regulatory approach with the type of with the type and relative volume of proportionate use of their enforcement tools naturally um, at the bottom of the pyramid is uh, encouraging compliance so information guidance education and advice and that is the most used hence it's the bigger part of the pyramid then as we move up the pyramid we go towards the more punitive um, actions. This is where we see at the very top um, our court sanctions, which are applied less frequently, as we saw in the statistics. Now, the pyramid also represents um, an escalation, so to speak, of enforcement. Uh, but there are some tools in here that are alternative responses. And naturally, they don't have to start at the bottom and work their way up. They can start anywhere in this in the pyramid. So I labelled the bottom as transformative tools. These are the ones we use internally, and we see regulators using a lot. Uh, and they are designed to act upon intrinsic, closely held motivations of duty holders. They take into account their learning styles, their strengths, their capabilities, and through education, advice, support, we help them to build those desires, knowledge and capability to comply. Then higher up in the pyramid, you'll see enforceable undertakings. They're considered uh, for more serious offences, which are, um, but they are collaborative, they're restorative, and they are truly transforming. Research shows when using uh, these transformative tools, 
with a persuasive approach, uh, they are very effective. Um, this is because they focus on respectful collaboration and structures that foster sustainable solutions and a culture of compliance. They work because they not only educate duty holders, uh, so they know what is expected of them, uh, but they also praise and encourage them so that they feel they have the ability to comply. So today I want to focus on enforceable undertakings, as Matt said, as they are quite often lesser known um, and involve a restorative approach. Under our model safety laws, the EU is a high level sanction designed to provide systemic and enduring outcomes tailored to the nature of the offence with broad benefits for the industry and the community. So regulators have a discretionary power to accept a written EU from a person in connection with an alleged contravention. However, in Australia, and I'm not sure if they've, cha they've changed the laws in New Zealand, um, it does not include a category one offence, uh, which are offences relating to reckless conduct, and it also excludes industrial manslaughter offence. So when people ask me, what is an EU? After a few Brexit jokes, I generally respond with, well, it's kind of like a contract in which the promises you make are enforceable in court. So basically, a business, a PCBU, makes an offer of an EU. It has all of the commitments and deliverables um, that they uh, promise to do, and they provide that to the regulator. So each regulator has published EU guidelines uh, for their process. The EU guidelines provide the duty holder with all the requirements, expectations and templates for the process. Uh, so if you're intrigued, go have a look. It's probably only about 10 pages. Um, it's really a transparent process. Um, and the development of the EU with the um, regulator can be as collaborative as the duty holder prefers. It's important to note that the regulator's actual decision maker is never part of the development process um, and even the evaluation process, uh, the initial evaluation process. And at no point throughout the development process is there ever a promise to the duty holder that the EU will be accepted. So the guidelines state that EUs are only accepted if appropriate given the circumstances and it's likely to deliver more wide ranging effects than can be achieved by prosecution, which in almost every case is possible due to the criteria for them to be accepted. There's a commitment to deliver significant, tangible, long term benefits for, um, to health and safety in the workplace, the industry and the broader community. So for this reason, they, they are financially uh, cost more than a prosecution. Uh, they, they also have a significant accountability cost that you actually don't read about that part of it. Um, and of course, you don't get a, an accountability cost with uh, a court penalty. So for many who go through the enforceable undertaking process, they describe these costs as an investment in, into improving health and safety. And almost every time they say, it was an investment they should have made earlier. So this is one of the reasons why EUs are transformative. They, they transcend from simply paying for your crime because they are designed to make these long lasting systemic changes to prevent incidents um, and incidents beyond the original offending environment. They're about changing behavior, taking positive action and not just making minimal rectifications to show mitigation. So EUs have been described as a form of restorative justice because they can bring together people to resolve collectively how to deal with the aftermath of the offence and its implications for the future. The benefits of the workplace, the industry and the broader community has similarities to the restorative justice triangle that looks like this. It looks to repair harm, restore relationships and create improved community safety, competency development and accountability. Sounds like an EU. 
And that's why I believe that EU is a sanction that turns a penalty into rehabilitation. So I say this because I've seen so many companies transform over the period of their EU. Generally, they're about three years. Some companies take a little bit longer, which is okay. Um, I had one uh, about a year ago, one very savvy businessman say to me, you know, Naomi, I could have just paid the fine, changed just a little bit, not much at all. But instead of, instead of that, doing the EU, my business is better off, my community is better off, and I feel better too. So I've got some quick stats on EUs for you. Since uh, the 1st of April 2016, uh, you guys have had 24 accepted EUs um, in New Zealand. This has seen uh, 3.8 million uh, distributed across workplaces, industries and community health and safety initiatives. Victoria and Queensland are the two longest running EU programs in Australia, sorry, health and safety EU programs. Uh, recently, Queensland made an EU comparison, which I, I kind of like how they've done this. I think it's a really good way of uh, demonstrating the value of the restorative approach. Um, so of the 145 EUs accepted in Queensland to date, there's a total of $38 million that has been spent on improving health and safety in workplaces, industries and communities. So what they did was they compared this to the equivalent that would have been given in penalties. So remember the um, 221 prosecutions um, that would have gone into consolidated revenue. So 8.7 million. And I think that's, uh, there's a very important point here is that um, when you pay the penalty, uh, it, goes, um, it goes into consolidated revenue and you don't really see the positive out of that. You don't really see what happens in the long run, what the impact is. Whereas enforcing a commitment to invest and improve health and safety across those three areas, there is a tangible and substantial impact that you can see So as I said before, EUs are described as a form of uh, restorative justice because they bring together people to resolve collectively how to deal with the aftermath of the offence and its implications for the future. Now, restorative justice is a term described um, to describe, sorry, a number of processes that bring together those affected by an incident or a conflict. And my research tells me that New Zealand is the country with the most developed programmic commitment to restorative justice. So I'm actually not going to lecture you guys on this at all. Um, Braithwaite, a researcher here in Australia, suggests that you guys are the vanguard. Um, one of his reasonings being because all sides of politics support restorative justice from mainstream conservative social democratic parties through to the right through to the right and the police. And he noted that the strongest opposition comes from lawyers and, and some judges. Um, from my experience, the reason behind this is um, the old lack of case law argument. Um, and so for them, there's this trade off between creating a precedent and the potential improvement delivered through an EU. For those of you who are less familiar with restorative practice. Um, an excellent example is a facilitated forum known as conferencing, like in the picture here. So conferencing actually brings together people affected by a specific incident uh, or conflict to understand what has happened, how people have been affected, to respond to the conflict, make amends and explore the possibility of preventing any further harm uh, and doing it together. It gives voice to victims and the affected third parties. So some people out there who are right into this, they're way smarter than me when it comes to restorative justice. And they say the reason this works is not because it's based on uh, resolving conflict. Uh, sorry, it is based on resolving conflict and not simply just trying to fix something with punishment. Uh, and they use the word conflict. Um, and I think that works really well because when we find um, what we find is when an incident occurs, it occurs, it happens um, on someone else's terms. Generally, it comes uninvited and it can't be undone. 
So this can leave strong negative feelings towards um, the people involved and the people responsible. And it creates this conflict between everyone, between colleagues and supervisors uh, and owners of businesses. So conflict by definition is strong negative feelings towards others. So any process that's going to respond to conflict must allow for those feelings to be acknowledged and talked through. They recommend a conference should only involve the stakeholders, victims and affected third parties for a specific incident. So depending on the scale of the incident, that might include workers, contractors, supervisors, managers, owners of the business, families, union groups, industry groups, and, and potentially others in the community. Experts say that uh, for the conference to be effective, it's important that the process is not dominated by a search for the truth or the facts. It's not an investigation, but rather a forum for understanding the impact of the incident and what it means for the future. So when I think about our processes, both regulatory and internal investigation processes within our companies, we certainly don't do that. We are clearly focused on finding the facts. So let's consider this idea of framing an incident as a form of conflict rather than a dispute. And when we do this, it creates a very different intent for our questioning and provides us greater opportunity to learn. So in a dispute process, we typically ask who did it and what do we have to do to them? Think about the process for your incident investigation in your company. Is it dominated by a search for truth or facts, creating the timeline? And if the answers you get don't align with your company policies and procedures or values, then are you off to HR for performance management? Instead, a restorative conference, we ask questions and we seek to understand what happened. How have people been affected? And what can we do to make things better? What this does is that it encourages people to express openly, to share with others, to deepen their understanding of what has happened. It allows the group to learn more about how they and others have been affected, to understand the emotional impact and eventually to determine what to do, if anything, to make things better. At this point, uh, regulators don't really engage in this type of conferencing with EUs, and it's something that I try to encourage if I come in and facilitate them. Now, I do wanna say, don't get me wrong, there is still um, a case um, to refer people to HR for performance management. But what the process does allow for is a better understanding of behaviours and why decisions are made. And I think if we're going to effectively influence behaviour and decision making, then we actually need a way to understand it. So I bring you to the idea of uh, restorative practice um, because I believe it needs to be better understood in the health and safety space. Um, I don't have all the answers, but I encourage you to go find them. Um, I think a, a greater balance between retributive and restorative justice um, can have a greater impact on compliance and preventing injuries and illnesses. So from an internal company perspective, uh, when we look at our company's policies, procedures and processes, what's the language used and, and how much of them are focused on punitive consequences? Um, is there anything in there about um, creating a, a conference of some sort? So does your, I've already asked this, but does your investigation process allow for a forum to, to really understand what happened and how people have been affected? I suggest you go and have a look at your systems and, and see if they all go straight to a dispute resolution policy. Um, does the investigation procedure escalate to performance management only? I, I recommend exploring uh, practices such as learning teams and appreciative inquiry. And there is a link there to David Cooper Ryder. I also challenge um, safety regulators to consider restorative practice 
uh, what that looks like from their perspective and how they can better incorporate the use of practices in their enforcement toolkit. In closing today, I want to leave you um, by saying that introducing more restorative practice into how we enforce health and safety, whether as regulators or as companies, is not about changing everything. It's not about throwing out the old and in with the new. Research shows there are some offenders who just do not respond to restorative approaches. And therefore there is no option than to use uh, punitive measures. So what I'm suggesting is about transforming the retributive mindset as there needs to be a balanced approach. Too much of our regulatory response is more about the stick and less about repairing harm, restoring relationships and reducing reoffending. And that segues very nicely into my last slide, which is a quote from Lewis B. Smedes. Restorative justice is not a replacement for retributive justice, but a complement. It seeks the rehabilitation of the wrongdoer and the repair of the victim's injury. So in a sense, it's a little bit like safety, different, uh, safety two, I should say, where it complements safety one. They should work together and not out with the old, in with the new. And that's, that's what I have, Matt. So I, I'm open to take questions. Awesome, thanks Naomi. Um, that was really cool, thank you so much. And yeah, there were a number of questions that came through whilst you were talking. Uh, we've got one from our good friend, Kevin Jones. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, all the way <laughs> from- <Hi>, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> Can't hide anywhere, can you? Um, Kevin uh, very kindly actually attended the New Zealand Health Safety Professionals Conference here in Christchurch last year and also took a recording um, interview with myself and a number of other participants and so yeah it's great to have him join us here today. His question though me is, um, is industrial manslaughter the clearest example of retributive justice we have? Oh well I, absolutely because I Whilst we um, have now seen um, imprisonment um, being awarded um, as penalties, definitely here in Queensland, um, I think most of those, uh, well, the case here in Queensland was appealed and so he's no longer in, uh, in prison. Um, there haven't been too many imprisonments uh, for health and safety um, offences. Oh, there goes the police. Um, so I think what we will find is, as industrial manslaughter spreads throughout the country um, and um, our regulators start to actually use that um, enforcement tool, we will start to see um, imprisonment. And I think that is ultimately the most um, punitive measure that we have. Um, you can't insure against going to prison. <laughs> No, no, actually, you know what, I actually, uh, do I take pleasure in it? No, not really. Uh, it's always interesting to tell or explain to business owners, senior leaders, that um, they can't insure themselves against health and safety uh, acts and, and laws. It's often a bit of a shock to them, and it's like, well, um, <laughs> it's just like a speeding ticket or a parking fine. You can't insure yourself against those either, guys, you know? So, yeah. Yeah, interesting times. I love the fact that New Zealand is considered the vanguard for uh, restorative justice. That's very exciting. <laughs> so it it um it has its roots in um, tribal culture. Um, yep. So yep, the Maoris, um, the Australian mm. Aborigines, um, and Canada, mm. um, the first people of Canada. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's brilliant. I think, I mean, it's certainly um, my experience here in New Zealand. I've been here for about 16 years now. There still seems to be, at its very core, um, a, a real sense of uh, democratic uh, value, um, that they see people's rights, individual rights, as, as integral to its culture. I think that's probably, we're now seeing that very, um, uh, very openly since the Health and Safety um, Act changed. So it's all very new, we don't have a great deal of case law to, to refer to, so instead we have to um, really focus in on what is culturally acceptable, what is our cultural norms. So it's um, definitely an interesting time. I think, the, I think the real key here, sorry, I'm gonna not answer your question for a moment, <laughs> is, um, is that accountability piece. So the particularly with the conferencing is, is um, if they are willing, having the victim and the offender in the room. And so we see a lot of this in uh, youth justice, um, mm -hmm. is that 
accountability that the the offender has to have to the victim mm -hmm. and it's what is it that they are going to do to repair the harm um, and restore a relationship if there was one originally yes. um, and it's that piece there so when we think of prosecution and you know fines and imprisonment it's all about they have to pay they have to pay yes. and I think this accountability piece of being accountable to the person you harmed um, is the ultimate payment um, mm. if you deliver upon that. Yeah, um, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and I also love the piece on learning teams, uh, that appreciative inquiry. I know uh, talking to um, Jono uh, recently, I know that the team at Kinetics have been doing quite a bit of this where they've moved away from the traditional ICAM type investigation technique where uh, three or four individuals lock themselves in a room, go through all the facts and figures and try and come up with the best root cause solution. Whereas what we're suggesting here is actually just to bring all of the actors together in a safe space to have that conversation, um, which ultimately is what the health and safety at work is, is truly trying to achieve, right? It's, it's all about communication and engagement. So um, yeah, super exciting to see that being put into practice with the use of EUs. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's good stuff. And, and learning teams, and so, uh, probably, <laughs> probably going to go against all the consultants here, but <laughs> learning teams and appreciative inquiry, there's heaps out there. It's not new stuff. Yes. Um, or you can literally Google it and find heaps of information about it. It's really simple. And like I encourage listeners, um, if they've got the resources, mm. is to run an ICAM yep. and actually also do a learning team or an appreciative inquiry and, uh, and see, see your two outcomes and um, you'll you'll see, I guess, how they can complement and, and inform each other, but mm. you will certainly get two very different um, list of actions. Yeah, I love that, <laughs> absolutely. No, do ourselves out of business. <laughs> it, it's really true, and I guess, like, for me, it's something that I've come to realise over the last few years, is that um, in order to continue to be successful at what it is we, we do, right? So we're all trying to make the world a safer place and to help people get home safely. Um, but we're moving away from the traditional tick box exercise, uh, which our profession has really fallen into the trap of doing for many, many years. And now we're starting to see the real value of those um, in integral skills, the soft skills, the, the ability to facilitate and to create safe spaces to talk openly and freely. I think that's really where um, the world of health and safety and other experts um, in various fields are going to have to head if they want to continue to be relevant. Mm. Actually, I'll go back on my point about consultants. Yeah. <laughs> um, when I, um, I've spoken about this previously, and one of the questions I had was, um, are there consultants out there? Yes, there are. Um, and should you use a consultant or a, an independent person? And yes is the question to that. Um, certainly someone independent. Uh, with restorative conferencing, there is a lot of preparation work that's done. Each person has an individual session. Mm -hmm. um, Obviously, they have to agree to attend a conference yes. um, and they need their own uh, preparation for that because it could be quite confronting coming into that room. Mm -hmm. uh, you imagine a room full of um, union reps and uh, victims and third parties and things like that. It could be quite heated. So there is a lot of preparation and um, particularly in those bigger cases. So, yes, I would encourage definitely someone independent to facilitate. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if, if you've still got time, there's, there's two more questions yep. I'd love to get uh, One's from Sarah Clark and she asks, are there some key articles or websites that you would recommend for AI and learning teams to start with or any good courses you'd recommend? Um, so in the slide there is David Cooper Ryder. Mm -hmm. um, he is the guy <laughs> of Appreciative Inquiry. Okay. Um, it has been around, oh, I think it was... Um, the theory of it was back in the 60s or something. So, I mean, you could probably go to your local library and find a, a book yep. even. <laughs> um, but David Cooper Ryder, certainly he was in Australia um, sometime uh, earlier this year, mm -hmm. uh, running um, more like masterclasses, I would suggest. Sure. Um, and I think he does have an online course, but he is American. So um, mm -hmm. they're possibly um, all courses are all in America. Yes. Oh, cool. Awesome. Thank you. And then finally, any advice for shifting directors or business owners from dispute to conflict approach when investigating incidents? Oh, it's always fun. <laughs> and it's the old, um, 
safety versus HR <laughs> argument. Um, and, you know, we, we want to do this. We want to work together. Uh, look, to me, the approach is to start with HR. Um, is to get them on board. They are human resources, so they are all about humans and or people and culture. Yeah. Um, you know, and if you have them on board and you work together and go together, I think you can start to um, make some moves in the executive level in the boardroom. Mm. Uh, it's it's like anything. You know, some good case studies, some some good evidence base uh, to support your. Um, your approach or your idea uh, will mm -hmm. certainly help. Um, that said, though, as I said, there still needs to be, you know, it, it's a balanced approach. You can't just wipe something out completely. So I don't think it necessarily is about removing performance management from companies. That's, mm -hmm. There still certainly needs to be there, but it's not performance management or EAP. There needs to be something in, in between, yeah. an alternative. Yes, absolutely. Oh, I love it. Well, um, thank you so, so much. This has been really, really valuable information. Um, Naomi's also very kindly um, uh, going to allow us to um, share a slightly more condensed version of the presentation, one that's shareable. Um, so you'll be able to see the slides and all of the really valuable links and, and content that goes with that. Um, but yeah, for now, thank you so much for your time, Naomi. Um, yeah, sorry I got your, your spelling wrong there. That's quite <laughs> That's okay, Matt. <laughs> I should say, that's okay, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so, I mean, if, if you've got the time, please, by all means, stick around, uh, watch the rest of the show. Uh, but I know you've got a busy schedule, so you just, you do what you need to do. Um, and um, if anyone, obviously, wants to get in touch with Naomi, all the contact details are there. Um, a bit of a superstar, someone who's also been very open to answering questions and, and engaging. Absolutely. LinkedIn, Twitter, yeah. email, oh, I don't cool. mind. Right. So, so thank you once again, um, and no doubt I'll be in touch soon. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, right. Matt.